Uh, hi, my name is Mike Lee. I'm a food product designer and innovation strategist from New York City. We help food companies uh, design new products and services that usher them into the future and grow uh, for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I want to talk about the future by starting in the past. And in 1940, my grandfather moved to uh, Detroit from Hong Kong with his three brothers and started the first Chinese restaurant in that city. So he was sort of the first food innovator in my life. And one of the things that he did with me growing up was take me to the auto show every year. And if you know me, I love going to the auto show, but I'm not really that into cars. Uh, I was not interested in the 1988 Ford Taurus necessarily. I was more interested in things like this, the concept car. And it really blew my mind further in my career, the idea of this concept car, because not only was it a fantastical kind of vision of the future, but it really staggered me how an industry as large and complex as the auto industry could dedicate time and resources every single year to a product that was simply not for sale. It was merely just a reflection of the aspirations of that time, and it really pushed the industry to think harder and more ambitious about their future. Fast forward to my career and starting food, and I remember coming to early trade shows and things like that at food shows, and I was looking for that concept car level thing. I didn't find it. I saw a lot of cool kale chips, found a lot of good kombucha, but I didn't see that kind of concept car level innovation. And so we wanted to create a space that sort of sat on the side of the industry to say, how can we kind of create a space to kind of dream a little bit harder and a little bit kind of maybe even more conceptual to kind of influence and inform people about where the future of food is going. So we created this project called the Future Market. And the mission of the Future Market is really to explore and how we'll produce, shop, and consume food over the next five to 25 years. We track about 16 different macro trends of change, and these are sort of our signals of change that we think are going to shape the future of food for all things kind of related to planet and people. And that's a really important lens in which we look at the influence that innovation has on, on the future of food. The main thing that we do is we've created these concept products. These are our 31 concept products, and the way to think about this is this is food's answer to the concept car. These are all conceptual products which don't exist yet, but they all represent kind of early stage trends, technologies, and behaviors that are happening today, extrapolated into the future. And it's a vision of what we might see on the grocery store shelf in the next five to 25 years. So for example, we have a conceptual product called Analyze Me, which is a disposable pill you can swallow every day. It analyzes the internal microbiome makeup of your stomach, and then it gets excreted out. And this data is captured and stored and analyzed to create a product like Custom Culture, which is a simple yogurt product, but it's precisely engineered to suit your microbiome. So this is an example of some of the concepts that we've uh, created and explored and played with. We've done three pop-up markets at the Fancy Food Show in New York and San Francisco, which sort of illustrate the experience in these products uh, uh, you know, in a very live, tangible way, um, and we're looking forward to making more pop-ups in the future. And so what I want to talk about today is I'm talking about four kind of macro trends of what's kind of happening and defining the future of grocery, and then two other things that I think don't get enough talk and don't get enough focus that I think to make a food future that's better for people and planet, we're going to need to amplify if we want to kind of get to a better food future. So as we know, the lion's share of the innovation that's happening right now is really around making a frictionless grocery experience. Michelangelo, when asked, how did you create the Statue of David, he simply said, I looked at a block of marble and I chiseled away everything that wasn't David. And I think this is a really great metaphor for what's happening in the grocery store today is because all this innovation around kind of omni-channel delivery, automation, and things like that is really meant to try to chip away all the things that aren't the core experience of just procuring the food that you want. So you're seeing so many innovations like Kroger and Nero looking at autonomy and self-driving cars to try to disintegrate that last mile. And of course, you look at Amazon Go, which is sort of, you know, everyone talks about and is really interesting as the future of kind of grocery. But I think it's more promising to see that there's six or so startups that are trying to democratize this idea besides what Amazon Go is doing and bring this idea of an automated grocery store to life in more realms other than Amazon. So as we kind of create this more frictionless experience and we kind of chisel away at the, at the reasons why you need to kind of go into a physical grocery store, the people who remain in a kind of physical paradigm have to really double down on the experiences that they create to justify you to get off the couch, put pants on, and go to the grocery store. If you look at movie theaters as an example, about 10, 15 years ago, we kind of saw this huge quality drop in movie theater experiences. They were dirty, they weren't that comfortable, there wasn't really good food there or anything like that. And then something like Netflix comes along, which completely disintegrates the idea of what it means to distribute and procure content. And 
what happened was the movie theaters really had to step up their game, and you started to see people kind of elevating the experience, the physical thing that couldn't be digitized by Netflix in a movie theater as well. This analogy, I think, is happening similarly in the grocery stores, where I think the ones that are going to thrive in the future really understand that they're going to double down on the physicality and turn that into a feature, not a bug. Um, and they really need to do things that kind of justify you getting out of the couch and getting there and experiencing something. Groceries are one way that they're doing it in an early way. In 2016, groceries uh, generated about 2.4 billion visits and $10 billion in sales. And I think a glimpse of how this is going to kind of elevate and escalate in the future is evidenced by what Hema has been doing in China right now, where one of the main attractions, one of the many attractions that you can have there, is this ability to kind of be really tangible with your food, choose your own seafood, have it cooked for you right there, and kind of have an experience that simply can't be digitized. So I think we're kind of elevating this this experience layer to a place where, you know, it's a grocerant today, but I think tomorrow we're just going to think of it as a standalone restaurant that just happens to be in a grocery store. Store, not something that's just kind of binded into the store. Groceries are going to be productive as well, too. So they're productive in food service for sure right now, but I think this is going to go further and further up in the supply chain. Food is, by and large, still produced here today, and I think it'll always be produced here in some form or shape. But I think what's happening is, as evidenced by things like Gotham Greens in uh, Williamsburg, who's growing a whole litany of greens and lettuces on top of a food uh, store. Uh, the idea of where you can kind of grow food is really rapidly changing and redefining this idea of local. Farm One is doing similar things with kind of growing microgreens and high-value produce in the basement of a restaurant kitchen. Um, and I think what happens is it's going to get even more interesting as we look at the rising trend of kind of cell ag and things like this, where uh, we can one day grow meat not in a farm but in a lab and presumably have something that looks sort of like this in the basement of a grocery store, thereby redefining the supply chain and where we can kind of produce food. And of course, personalization is, is eating everything. It's eating grocery uh, as well, too. But I think it's important to kind of step back and see why it's happening and why people are kind of gravitating towards this. Piper Jaffrey has a stat that says, for the first time ever, teens are spending more on food than clothing. And this is really magnificent because if you think about you as a teenager, think about how you use clothing to express yourself. And think about the things that you looked for in clothing to kind of extend who your identity was and make a statement about yourself. Um, maybe it was a pair of Air Jordans, maybe it was a jean jacket, what have you. But I think food is also becoming that locus of identity. It's becoming an extension of how we want to express ourselves to the world and make a statement about what we stand for and what we believe. So we've become values-based shoppers in terms of food. And in CPG especially, food tribes have really created, uh, clustered around these kind of value systems. Um, these food tribes are really kind of distinct, unique ways by which people uh, gather together and have a point of view about food. And really, essentially, they're just different value systems on how people choose food. As we can also see in the last 10, 15 years in the food industry, uh, every single kind of legacy player has been challenged by some sort of upstart player who's really a values-based, tribal-based kind of uh, innovator looking to unseat the, the, uh, the incumbent. Thrive Market and companies like this are already recognizing this by not only giving you opportunities to shop by category, which everybody does, but to also shop by values. And I think this is a really massive sea change in how we look at people because people are no longer really giant segments. They're kind of really micro segments uh, that are really based upon the individuality that they have. And while today we're going to shop with our values, tomorrow we're really going to shop with our biology. And this is where it gets much more interesting when you see things like uBiome trying to map your microbiome and collect that data, platforms like HealthKit and all the other myriad kind of activity trackers that can track what you're doing, um, and then things like SRI's Food Recognition Project, which are trying to advance the state of food vision that can help record the kind of things that we're inputting to our bodies and make that data much more enriched uh, as a data set. The idea is to really kind of collect this data so that we can get to a future vision of kind of creating just-in-time food that's made uh, just for that individual right when they need it. You're already seeing early stages of this happen with things like Nestle's Wellness Ambassador Program, where about 100,000 people have been sharing photos of their food and some uploading their DNA to get personalized recommendations for nutrition and food uh, for you. So it's already happening in microcosms, and I think it's going to get even further. So the end of one-size-fits-all food is really, really near, um, and it's happening faster and faster. And if you look at kind of, this is sort of what's capitalized, this is what's happening right now in terms of the grocery store experience is becoming frictionless, experiential, productive, and personalized. But I think 
looking forward, there's two more things that I think we need to kind of make this accelerate and make it a much more interesting kind of future of food. And, um, you know, how might we build a grocery experience that's going to be better for people and planet? And I think there's two things, one for people and one for planet, that I would really advocate that we all kind of as an industry spend more time to focus on and kind of push ahead. The first thing here is what I sort of call a universal food and health ID. Right? So this idea of personalization is really happening in fits and starts, and everybody's kind of looking at different pieces of the elephant, but not realizing what the whole elephant looks like. All this data is being collected in different silos around your activity, your nutrition, your biology, and things like this. But what I propose is that we need to kind of have an open, interoperable consortium where that we can collect this data and have it owned by the user, and have it be portable depending on have it be portable so that you can take it to just any kind of channel that you want, whether it be a grocery store, a restaurant, uh, anything else to kind of use this and, and kind of adapt it and create personalized food for, for you. At the pop-up that we did in New York City, uh, we had a kind of rudimentary version of this that we called Food ID. And essentially, you would start your shopping experience in a digital paradigm where we'd ask you 12 questions. And based off these questions, we'd try to plot you on a plot, a two-by-two -two plot of, are you kind of interested in being a gourmet, a healthy person, a sustainability person, or a value person? And this kind of Food ID followed you through the experience. And based off of that profile, we kind of narrowed down our 31 products to the top eight that kind of fit you and using kind of digital projection mapping on the, retail, uh, on the retail display, we were able to kind of cater the grocery store set uh, to something that fit your profile specifically. Second thing that I think is, uh, has to do with the products itself, and this is around planet. Um, you know, agriculture obviously has the biggest impact on what is happening with the planet and sustainability, and I think we need to kind of find a way to evolve the conversation around sustainability to actually be a little bit more selfish. And today, this is sort of kind of shorthand for what sustainability looks like, right? We've got stamps and seals covering all the food that we have here. And there's sort of that shorthand that tells you this is a more sustainable food. But I would beg to ask the question, and the question we have to answer is, what does sustainability taste like? Does anybody know? When's the last time you went to a meal and you just sat up and you said, oh, that was so sustainable? Um, and I think we have to take a cue from companies like Tesla, which obviously is a sustainability company, but you don't always really think of it that way. I think the masterstroke of a company like Tesla is that they took something like sustainability, injected this sex appeal and selfish, visceral need into it so that you may or may not care about the state of the planet or the state of energy. You care about just going really fast and looking really good. Um, so I think this is sort of the next wave of where we need to kind of take sustainability in food. Um, and I think it really summed up um, a lightning rod moment that I had years ago that before we started the future market um, at Blue Health, where Dan Barber is really great and masterful at kind of weaving these stories of sustainability into um, really great delicious things that just everyone can understand whether or not you care about sustainability. So he had a dish called Rotation Risotto, which was basically a risotto made from rotational crops. It not only took the crops like wheat, but it took all the cover crops that support those crops and create a healthier soil base, a healthier kind of way of growing that doesn't require as much pesticides, doesn't require as much herbicides. And it was really great to see that he weaved this complex story about sustainability in something that was so simple and so visceral and easy to understand. However, I kind of bothered me the fact that it costs about $1,000 to go there for two people. And so this is not accessible. So it kind of led to our first concept product, which really colors our point of view in the world, and it was the Crop Crisp. And simply, we took this idea of rotation risotto using rotational crops and turned it into a $5 box of crackers. That's super delicious, accessible to everybody, not really purposefully kind of democratic and almost boring in a sense. Um, and you may or may not care about the state of crop rotation, but we just want to sell you a, a delicious, amazing cracker that you can use every day. And by doing that, how can we build a huge amount of demand that actually supports a food system behind the scenes that's going to be better for the planet? So I think the thing that we have to realize in sustainability is like we have to get to a point where we can connect the sustainable values of, of good agriculture and progressive agriculture to just simple, visceral, amazing, selfish needs. Because I think that's the way to kind of scale this idea of sustainability beyond where we're going uh, today. Um, you know, you might 
get a lot of people doing sustainable things because of altruistic needs, but I think to scale this into the mainstream, we have to bring it back to the person. And I always like to say that taste and experience gives you the license to talk about everything else. And I think that goes not just for sustainability, but for everything that we do as innovators. And you have to remain human-centered in everything you do. And I think if we do that, we'll build a better future of food. And I look forward to doing that with you. Thank you.